and it's this time of year that uh, kind of brings nostalgia. It's it's kind of a it's such a special time of year anyway, as we talk as we introduce Advent and begin the what we call the season of Adv Advent. It's just a special time. Uh, prophecy has a lot to do with that, but Joshua also explained that Advent actually means coming, uh, and you can include in that arrival, you know, he has arrived, which is just a great concept, you know. Uh, so Advent is just a, what a special time of year. And the focus uh, is preparation for us, or it, sh it should be, let's put it that way, it should be preparation for us to celebrate the birthday of Jesus the Christ. Literally, happy birthday, Jesus. Don't we say Merry Christmas, Merry Christ Mass, but, you know, happy birthday, Jesus, what I say, you know. And I'm going I'm to find a, one of those spotlights that puts that on the side of the house. As you go down to Epworth, you can see it on the brick. You know, you guys go by my house. Happy birthday, Jesus, you know, and, uh, because that's what it is. So that, this focus that we have on that is phenomenal, and that is what we call his first advent, his first coming, his first arrival, uh, uh, the birth, his birth. Uh, and, of course, we also have the anticipation of him coming back, his return, and we've historically and traditionally called that second coming. I've got some thoughts on that I'm going to share with you in just a moment that hit me that are not in my notes or in your notes because it hit me after the fact, and I love you, but I wasn't going back to rewrite all that. Because <laughs> it was just too soon to do it, but but I'll share those with you. But that's all. This anticipation, Advent, then is far more than just simply marking some you know two thousand year old event. It's much more than that. It's so current. It's so uh, past, present, and future. And that's what's so great about this time of year. Now I realize too that there are people who argue, well, this is not. Uh, accurate in terms of uh, the calendar when this happened and all that. It's always a hard issue. Always, always. Everything we do is a hard issue. We're probably, we'd probably never get the exact date, so, but it's a hard issue. So know that about what we're doing here and everything that we do. It does have to do with the heart. But here, Advent is the action then, uh, these next five weeks, I guess it is, uh, celebrating a truth about God by remembering the revelation of Jesus Christ uh, so that all creation has the opportunity to be reconciled to God. All of us. Uh, and that, what a great celebration that is. We don't usually think about that kind of thing at Christmas, but that's really what it is, God coming in the flesh to reconcile all of us back to him. What a, wow, now that's an arrival. That's an event that's worth celebrating. This, so this is about his first, his second, and his third coming. And this, the, Now let me elaborate on that because this is what hit me after I wrote everything down. His first coming, obviously we know, was in the flesh. God came in the flesh the first time, his arrival. Uh, the second time he came was when he went back to the Father and sent his Holy Spirit. That's the second coming. Because he came to dwell in us and get us ready to live a life where he's Lord and Savior to prepare us for when he really does become king. Because, you know, if we can't live for, as Lord and Savior him in, in us now, how are we going to do it in eternity when he really is the king? So he's preparing us for that. Second coming was the arrival of the Holy Spirit to live in us. The third coming is when he comes back as king. So, so I see it as a triune event, a triune experience, just like God, Trinity, first coming, second coming, third coming. Now, some people are freaking out right now. Well, wait a minute. But if you look in your Bibles, no matter which translation or interpretation you read, the word second coming are not in there. Just a, even the concept is really not in there. So that's why I bring this up. I think it's neat to think, well, his second coming is when he came and lived in my heart. His arrival, his advent. So that's why this season is even more special than what we thought because we're dealing with past, present, and future. We are dealing with God being I was, I am, and I will be. All in the beginning, God. In the end, God. Uh, eternal. What? That's Advent. Uh, it's it's such a such a hope that a lot of people don't have and have yet to discover, and we hope that they do. But we're celebrating this. So this is about his first, second, and third coming. And in this triple focus, 
you know, past, present, and future, in this triple focus, Advent also symbolizes our journey, the walk that we're on, because we all have a past, present, and future. And, and sometimes we have trouble dealing with that. Sometimes we live over here in this past, or we live over here in this future, and we, and we forget all about the present. You know, God, this is Christmas. God wants you to open your present. Your present. God wants you to open your present where you are right now. Quit living in the past. Quit living in the future and open your present. I hope you got that because I just did. Yes. <laughs> this stuff, I got to share it with you when it comes. But we have a spiritual journey. And in our journey, we reaffirm, or hopefully we do, we reaffirm by the light of Christ with us in us and through us, we reaffirm that he has come. He has arrived once already. He's arrived again when he came in our hearts, and he's going to arrive again sometime, I think, in the near future. And when he comes back the third time, it is going to be in power. In power, the King of Kings, the Alpha and Omega, the Lord of all lords, when he comes back, it ain't going to be no thing. It's going to be powerful, powerful. So we can stand up and proclaim that. We can actually use these words according to Scripture. We can use these words to encourage each other. And we should be. We don't do it enough, but we should be. He's coming back. Oh, he's, he'll be back. He'll be back. Amen. He will. And look out when he does. So as we celebrate God breaking into history in the incarnation, and then we celebrate him breaking into this uh, dwelling in our own personal history, and we celebrate a future consummation in which all creation is even now groaning, awaiting its redemption, let us be aware of our own responsibility as people who are involved in partnership with God on this. Let us be aware that we are commissioned to love the Lord God with all our heart, mind, soul, everything that we are, and love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. Two things, especially now, especially during Advent. Let's remember those two things because everything else is underneath that, according to Jesus' words. Advent is always marked by expectation and anticipation and preparation and longing. Now, sometimes it's ex expectation and anticipation for, you know, Christmas morning when you open presents, you know, but that's okay. You know, sometimes it's anticipation of, of going out there on, on Black Friday, which why you would ever do that, I don't know. Jesse and I did that one year. And haven't done it since. That was terrible. I didn't know little old ladies could be that mean. We were just getting it, trying to get a Christmas tree. And Jesse's, you know, six foot something, 350 pounds. She about threw him to the ground. John. Anyway, so why you'd ever want to do it? So there is some different type of longing and anticipation going on all around us. But ours is actually for a different reason. As born again from above Christians, we all have this distinctive yearning for deliverance from this world. From all this stuff going, don't you want to be delivered from, just, <laughs> we should get t-shirts. Lord, deliver me from the news. Yeah. I mean, just deliver me from it. Because it's nothing but, wow, wow. <laughs> You know, we finally just don't even turn it on anymore, you know. But we all long for this. It just delivers from all this stuff. We have a supernatural anticipation. Some of us haven't become totally aware of this yet. But we have a supernatural anticipation because the Holy Spirit is in us that there's a king coming who is going to rule with truth and justice and righteousness over his people and his creation over everything. It is our hope that expects the return of the anointed one, a Messiah who's actually going to bring peace and justice and righteousness to a brand new heaven and earth once and for all. Amen. Once and for all. Yeah. I know we, we get prophecy, which is what first Ad, our first Sunday in Advent is about, prophecy of all this doomsday and apocalypse and all that. Well, there'll be some of that stuff, but don't forget, there's going to be a brand new heaven and a brand new earth. There's going to be new life, new joy, no more tears, no more crying, no more suffering, no more pain because of the arrival of the king of all kings. Amen. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right, Deb. Man. I wish you knew how much this hurt to talk right now. I have this sore throat cold thing going on. But, but I don't care. Because it's exciting. We need excitement. We need hope. We need something, as, as Jesus says, cheer up. 
You know, be of good cheer. This is all good news. So our season of Advent comes to us to be celebrated in terms of past, present, and future. We celebrate in remembrance and also in memorial as well as expectation and anticipation. It's just a great time of year. And while this can be a season of repentance for some of us, it's also a season of joy and happiness and awaiting the coming of the king. Haven't you ever noticed even for the secular world, there's something that happens during this time of year. It's like, well, more so when I was growing up, I think, because I was more uh, I was younger and aware of it, but used to be, man, some would sweep over the entire neighborhood and everybody was nice. Yeah. Even mean old Mr. Eastman, you know, down the street, you couldn't walk across his yard. Get out of my yard! Christmas time is, wow, well, Merry Christmas, young man, how you doing? What happened? Is it the spirit just sweeps over our community? Have you noticed that? Or am I the only one that needs medication? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, I see, yeah. You have no, it's just a strange, when you're growing up, remember that special feeling? Ooh, it's Christmas season. It's something just would, would take over people, but that's that expectation of a much greater experience. And, and so ex, let's look at expectations just briefly, just as far as our expectations and the world we're surrounded by. We live in a world, expectations now, we live in a world which bigger and better define our expectations. I mean, it's every advertisement is, you know, something you don't have, something that's bigger, something that's better. We live with those type of expectations, and it's brainwashed. We are brainwashed with it from the moment we can uh, comprehend and understand. We have become so enamored by supersized, super high definition, uh, superstars, all of it. I mean, it's all just bigger and better. We tend to view life through this lens that magnifies what we expect out of the world so so much so that we miss all the potential in the small stuff. We miss it because we're not looking at it. We're looking at the bigger and better. And God wants us to look at the, the small and obscure, the odd, as Scripture puts it, peculiar. You know, that's what God wants us to see. Now, you're going to have bigger and better. Obviously, you are. But we don't want to miss the small. Why? The prophet Zechariah talked about it in Zechariah 4.10. We should not despise the day of small things. That's what it says. Because if you think about your life, even your relationship with the one that you love, it's the small things that bind you together. You know, it's when they, I know we've talked about this, but it's when they shut off the electricity and you play Monopoly by candlelight. That's like, yes. Made you close. It's the small things that matter. Do not despise the day of small things. The fact is, no, what our, no matter what our expectations may be, God does some of his best work with small beginnings and impossible people. Impossible situations as far as that goes. But the, I know your life, you can say, you should be saying, yes, amen, brother Jerry, yes, <laughs> You know, because you think about your life. God does some amazing, amazing work with, with some impossible people. It's humbling to read the Old Testament and think about this. And this all has to do with Advent because there's special things going on all around us that we miss because we're so busy looking at bigger and better. But if you see uh, the people that we sometimes uh, lift up on a pedestal, how fragile and how imperfect all of them were, maybe it'll help you along the way. Abraham was just a big baby. He was a big coward. He was a cow. He, he couldn't believe all that God had told him. And if you read about his actions, you'll see that. Jacob was a cheat who and struggled with everybody. I mean, he had... We might even call him dual personality today. I don't know. Joseph was somewhat immature, and no doubt he was very arrogant at times. Moses was so impatient, he murdered somebody because he couldn't wait for God. Gideon was a, well, he was a big chicken, and he worshiped Baal. Uh, uh, some people say, you know, the old term yellow belly, you know. Uh, Samson was a womanizing drunk. Really, really. David is this power-abusing adulterer who also had murder committed. Solomon turns out to be a very unwise, wise man. Uh, Hezekiah is this reforming king who could not go quite far enough. And then finally you have, to me, the ultimate example, a very young Jewish girl in a tiny, small village in a remote corner of, of a great empire becomes the mother, the avenue for God to come into the world. 
think about all. It never ceases to amaze me. God often, and probably the majority of the time, begins with small things and inadequate people. He doesn't pick who we would pick. Yeah, we would pick Billy Graham, you know, or somebody like that, I think. But he doesn't pick that person. Not, not, it certainly seems that God could have chosen bigger things and better people to do his work in this world. It certainly seems that way to us. But if God can use them, if God can reveal himself to them, to all these inadequate people, then what can he do with me? Amen. What can he do with you? Some great things. Some great things. It means that he is able to use you. No matter what you think of yourself or what your family tells you, they think of you because they will. God can use you no matter how inadequate and unwise and lacking in faith you may think that you are at time. At times, God wants to use you by virtue of his advent in you. His arrival in you. In you. That's why he's in there, not just to be in there so you can walk around while God lives in me. <laughs> you know, something's got to happen with that. It's, just, it's not just, it's never just for you. You know, that was kind of goofy one that I think, I think it was. So we have to be careful that we do not in our own self-righteousness put limits on what God can do with the smallest of things and the most inadequate of people, the most unlikely of people, uh, especially in the most hopeless of circumstances. Because that's where God is. That's where he does his best work. This is a large part of the wonder of what we call this Advent season. God uses the smallest of things and the most unlikely of people. One of, the, one of the main purposes of the incarnation of Jesus Christ the first time was to provide hope. One of the main reasons for the second coming of Jesus Christ is to provide hope. One of the main reasons for the third coming of Jesus Christ is to provide hope. Hope, hope, hope. Oh, now, now, the early church celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ like you would not believe. I mean, they even had Humor Day. You know, I forget what it was called, Josh. I think you... Holy Humor. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, they celebrated the resurrection. Yes, they talked about the crucifixion and, and the death of Jesus and atonement of sin, but most of their celebrations, the early church of Jesus Christ, most of their celebrations revolved around the hope of Jesus through his resurrection. That's what they spent most of their time celebrating. Hope. It was a proclamation of truth that rang throughout the Old Testament that endings are not always endings, but they are opportunities for God to bring new beginnings. Some of you are going through some things in your life you think it's an ending, but it's actually a God opportunity for a brand new beginning, and that's hope. That's what hope is. That's, that's where hope is found. The resurrection proclaimed this truth, even, even about our greatest fear with death itself. You know, that's our first greatest fear. Our second greatest fear is public speaking. There's death and public speaking. So speaking at your own funeral is out of the question. Yeah. You'd be too afraid to do it. Our biggest fears. Advent is about hope period. And all the prophecies point to that in terms of Jesus fulfilling them and, and what's about to happen when he comes back the third time. It's all about hope. It's not just hope for a better day or hope for the lessening of pain and suffering, although that's in there. Uh, it's certainly significant. This is about hope that our existence right now in the present has meaning, has purpose. We are here for a reason beyond our present experiences. And I know that's, that's difficult to comprehend, but we're here for hope beyond our present experiences. We have a hope that the limits of our lives are not nearly as narrow as we experience them to be. God is a God of small things and new things. All things with him become possible. Isaiah 42, 9, indeed, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things before they spring forth. I proclaim them to you. 
of the possible, the new, new beginnings. Matthew 19, 26, but Jesus looked at them and said, with people, as far as it depends on them, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Mark 14, 36, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. See, we haven't changed. As God's people, we have not changed. God's people in the first century wanted him to come and change their circumstances. That's what they wanted. That's what they expected. That's what they prayed for. That's what they looked forward to. They were angry when those immediate circumstances did not change. But that's a short-sighted view of the nature of hope. And if you're in that position now, you got to know that's a short-sighted view of the nature of hope. Our hope cannot be in circumstances. They cannot be, no matter how badly we want them or how important they are to us or how, how badly we want to get out of them, the reality of human existence is that God's people experience physical existence in the same way that everybody else does. Christians die. Christians get sick. Christians get in car wrecks and get maimed for... Uh, and, and crippled Christians are victims of violent crimes and, and we're hurt and, and killed every day bombings war in some parts of the world we experience famine if our hope is only in circumstances we have nothing different than the world has nothing different but our hope is not in circumstances we hope in God in God now, sometimes the circumstances change, but most of the time, we change. We see it differently, and then before we know it, then it changes. So the change going on, the advent that needs to happen is God's arrival in us first, which changes us. It's bound to change. If it doesn't change you, maybe that's not the Holy Spirit. Something's going to happen. If God takes up residence in you, something's going to happen. Something. Of course, we hope that's productive, and we hope you go along with it. Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly more than all we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes, or dreams, according to his power that is at work within us. God has revealed himself to be a God of newness and a God of possibility, of redemption, the recovery of transformation, of possibility from endings that go beyond what we can think or what we can even imagine. The best example of that is the crucifixion itself, followed, obviously, by the resurrection. Why do I say that? Because the shadow of the cross even fell over the manger. Hope is what I'm talking about. Not in circumstances, but hope in God. If you will hope in God, you will walk through the fire, come out on the other end, and not even smell like smoke. And now, you won't necessarily go around it or avoid it, but you'll go through it. It all begins in the hope that God did come, and he's going to come again. That's the hope of Advent. He will reveal himself to everybody as a God of newness and possibility, a God of new things to everybody. Every knee will confess, every tongue will confess, every knee will bow that Jesus Christ is Lord to, to the glory of God the Father. It's going to happen. That's what Advent, the arrival, is all about. We anticipate all this, the incarnate Jesus. We groan and long for the newness with the hope of expectation. And find confidence in the hope that, yes, uh, he first came as an infant, but when he comes back the third time, he's going to break the skies and come back as king. Hope. That's what Advent is all about. Those who have suffered and still have hope understand far more about God than those who have not. I, I really do believe that. And that's what hope is about. It's a way to live. It's not just a survival mode. You know, in survival mode, you're only concentrating on that moment of survival. You can't really think about anything else. But hope is a way to live. It's a lifestyle. Authentic, right in the middle of all of it. I asked Sarah if she was wearing her boots today because she's going to need them. But it didn't come out what I was trying to say. You know. <laughs> but right in the middle of all of it, right in the middle of all of it, hope. Hope, the light, 
of course, which we know is Christ the Lord. And, and maybe that's what hope is, to live with faith that continues to see possibility when there is no present evidence of anything being possible. Just because God is God, no other reason, I have hope. Because God is God. He came to prove that. He came as a baby, the, the most precious of human beings, a baby, Luke 2.10, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. He came as a baby. Then he said, if I go away, the Holy Spirit will come, will arrive, will advent and, and fill you and arrive and be in you, and you'll be able to walk and live this life. And then the third time it's talked about in Acts 111, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. Advent, we begin this season knowing this is about his first coming, his second coming, and his third coming. And I encourage you with everything that you have, let this hope live. Let it live. Please bow your heads with me. As the musicians come back, we're going to close with a song. But take time, just you, between you and God right now, take time to talk to him and commune with him. and Let him know that you want to let hope live. Especially during this time of year, but every day of your life, you want to allow hope to live. No matter what your circumstances are, that you have hope just because he is who he says he is. Talk to him about that this morning before we close.